person only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with CLAFS. And today's webinar will provide an overview and key findings from the Improving Global Comparability of Appliance Energy Efficiency Standards and Labels Report. And one important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And I just want to go over some of the webinar features. You, for audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. And if you do choose to listen to your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing this will just eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And then if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone options in the audio box. And then a, a box will display uh, the telephone number and the audio pin that you should use to dial in. And panelists, just a reminder, we do ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone's having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinar help desk at the number at the bottom of the slide. That number is 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point during the webinar. And to do that, simply go to the question pane and you can type in your question and then submit it there. Um, we will receive those and present them to the panelists during our question answer session following the presentations. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you'll find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. You may follow along as our speakers present. Also an audio recording of the presentations will be posted to the Solution Center training page within a few days of today's broadcast. And we are also now adding all future webinars to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you'll find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Debbie Carpe Weil, Mia Forge Puri, and Frank Klickenberg. And the webinar will present an overview and key findings of the improving global comparability of appliance energy efficiency standards and labels report. And this analysis report provides policymakers with international comparisons of energy performance requirements and product coverage. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I just want to provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solution Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session where the panelists will address those questions submitted by the audience, and then followed by closing remarks and a very brief survey. So this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be formed. And the Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011. And is primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you are attending today. And the Solution Center has four primary goals. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. And third, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And our primary audience is energy policy makers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and also civil society. And so this sl slide provides a little information on one of the marquee features that the Solutions Center provides, which is the no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are each available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of appliance and equipment, we are very pleased to have Kristen Egan, Executive Director of CLASP, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in appliance and equipment, 
or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, it's provided free of charge. So to find out if the Ask an Expert service can benefit your work, please contact me directly at sean.esterly at nrel.gov or at uh, my phone number, which is 303-384-7436. And we also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So in summary, we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center's resources and services, including the expert policy assistance, the database of clean energy policy resources, subscribe to the newsletter for additional information, and participate in webinars like this one. And so now I'd like to provide some brief introductions for our today's distinguished panelists. Our first presenter that we'll be hearing from is Debbie Carpe-Weil, a senior associate at CLASC, where she provides programmatic support to the Seed Global Efficiency Metal Competition. And then following Debbie, we will hear from Mia Forbes-Perry, a director with the Policy Partners. And Mia has worked on two of the world's leading appliance standards programs, the U.S. Appliance Standard Standards Program with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the UK Market Transformation Program. And then our final speaker today is Frank Klickenberg. Frank is also a director with the Policy Partners and the founder of Klickenberg Consultants and has been involved in establishing and shaping new policy frameworks and legislation in energy efficiency for more than 15 years. He has worked on energy efficiency programs in over 30 countries around the world and has set up and carried out monitoring of numerous government policies. And so with those brief introductions, um, I'd now like to welcome Debbie to the webinar. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to roll out this study that we've been working on uh, for a number of months, uh, about, about 18 months now. And, um, we're excited to announce with this webinar the publishing of the report. Uh, everyone should have received an email with that web address uh, in it. And if not, it will also be in this presentation uh, towards the end. So the reason that we did this study is that there are a lot of variations in product policy components. And these lead to difficulty in comparing these policies from country to country. Uh, next slide. So in order to address this, we, uh, CLASP and the policy partners, who you hear from, from for the majority of this presentation, collected data to compare these components of product policies for more than 100 products across nine economies. Those nine economies are Australia, China, the European Union, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and the United States. And the main goal of this, of this work is to improve the technical foundations to enable viable policy improvement. Um, and this study contributes to global knowledge as well as furthering the work of initiatives like SEED, which as Sean mentioned is one of the clean energy ministerial initiatives. Um, and CLASP is also the operating agent for SEED. And as the operating agent, uh, CLASP collects this kind of data and is in a position to also support action on it through the SEED initiative in order to turn this technical information into um, what we hope will be policy improvements. Um, this work builds on a study that was completed in 2011 called Opportunities for Success and CO2 Savings from Appliance Energy Efficiency Harmonization. Um, that was uh, the, the first study of its kind to really look at what the opportunities are for improving the alignment of policies across countries. And this study that we're just publishing now extends that initial study with a stronger evidence base. We've collected more data, uh, extended the number of products, and uh, increased the number of countries. So this was a really ambitious undertaking, and uh, we're very excited to share the results with you today. Um, I have a few questions for you to think about as we go through this presentation. Um, and these might be things that we can talk to in the question and answer period um, at the end. So some of these questions to think about include, uh, as we go through and talk about different product opportunities, um, are there some products in particular that it would be good for, that it would be beneficial for the for international standards organizations such as the ISO or the IEC to take the lead on? <clears throat> um, what could CLASP uh, 
uh, or for that matter, seed due to further uh, alignment opportunities. Um, how much of this do we think requires manufacturers to take the lead? And again, how exactly would how how do you think that class can help move move alignment forward? Um, so with that, I'm going to hand off the discussion of the results of the study uh, to Mia Forbes Piri to talk about what we did uh, what we did in the study. Hi, thanks, Debbie. So um, obviously, often in developing in the development of energy efficiency policies like standards and labels, you want to be able to compare policies from other economies and see what you can learn from what's already out there instead of having to reinvent the wheel every time. There's different test procedures and different energy efficiency metrics and labels sometimes make it difficult to make meaningful comparison. So the report that we've drawn together aims to address this issue. The report and the conversion factors that it contains were developed through four main tasks. First, there was a, an inventory of MEPS minimum energy performance standards and labels and the underlying test procedures and metrics that were drawn together from the various nine economies. In doing this, we collected data for over 400 policies. Uh, and the types of data are listed on the slide. We then assessed the energy performance levels across the different economies. And from that, we developed conversion factors and assessed the robustness of those conversion factors. We developed uh, different types of conversion factors, conversion factors for test procedures and conversion factors for the energy efficiency metrics. And w the conversion was generally from or towards an international standard, such as an ISO standard or an IEC standard. Uh, it varies. It's the one that's the most applicable uh, by products. Not all conversions are made equal. So we developed a traffic light system. And before explaining the traffic light system, I should probably say that the, the conversion factors that we developed, the aim of this study is really to help develop policies at a macro level. So you can't go down to a specific product and use the conversion factor to, to convert. The idea is it gives you an order of magnitude and you can't you shouldn't even use it for subtypes. It's just, on average, what do this type of product do? Uh, so to evaluate or to give an indication of how robust the conversion factors are, we used a traffic light system, which you'll see in the report, which I'm sure you'll all be reading avidly after this call, if you haven't read it already. Uh, so green indicates a high level of confidence around 10%, uh, then amber, a slightly lower level of confidence that the results are probably within 25% of the indicated value, and red are conversion factors that are probably more than 25% out, and you need to obviously be pretty wary of those. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please. So we looked at um, the key findings, SNL policy aspects. We looked at efficiency metrics, product definitions, and requirement scope as important as test procedures in, in the alignment of, of SNL. Um, when we looked at alignment, there was quite a wide range of alignment. And we looked at alignment potential as well. All of the products have alignment potential to some degree or another. But the alignment potential is not the same for every product. It can be quite different. So some products can be aligned in terms of their test procedures and their minimum energy performance standards, 
whereas for other products it would only be possible to align them in terms of their test procedures and still further maybe only certain components of the test procedures. Uh, in general, we, when, when selecting the countries and the products, we went uh, as wide as we, we felt that we could within the scope of the, the time and resources available. And we decided to go as wide as we could and provide the information that we could find rather than, uh, than own, not provide information where it wasn't possible. So, so data was sometimes hard to come by, and where that was the case, that's indicated. Um, and Frank will talk you through the next slide, which is uh, SNL policy elements. Thank you, Mia. And I'd like to start telling you a little bit about our findings. And before I do that, I'd like to tell you a bit first about how we've looked at this in general, how we've defined SNL and, and, and the various levels in standards and labels. We often talk about standards and labels as one thing, that there is a standard and that's it. And that you look at a standard as it is, or a label and look at how comparable that standard is. What we've done for this study, study is, is, is disentangle that a bit. And I'd like to talk you through this starting from the bottom up in the slide you see right now. Starting with product definitions, an, an often forgotten part actually of standards and labels. Uh, but, but quite relevant. When different economies define a product in different ways. And what, one obvious example that many of you will have seen before has to do with, uh, with air conditioners. Um, what, what many countries call central air conditioners, uh, whole house units with, with ducts. Is actually labeled as a room air conditioner in the US. Now, this may seem trivial. It probably is from a US perspective. It probably is also from the perspective of the other economies. For a comparison, it actually isn't. It means that the same product is covered by different regulations and it's actually a different product in different economies. That's a pretty trivial one in, in some ways. Um, some things are also trivial but also quite relevant in that, for example, motors are regulated in different ways. Some economies regulate motors up to 200 kilowatts, others up to 375 kilowatts, some up to 400 horsepower, and it's all broadly in the same range, but it isn't the same, uh, which means that there are some things that really fall through the cracks and, and, and are therefore incomparable. A next step is test procedures. Uh, that, that is a pretty common one, and we all look at test procedures when we look at how products are rate, rated and ranked in various economies. Um, Test procedures obviously are important. ISO IEC test procedures are very well known, um, are common to many economies and, and their standards and labels. And yet there are still relevant differences. And one example of such a difference where you might not expect this is, for example, in washing machine energy demand. Um, Europe and India basically use the same test procedure for washing machines. The main difference is that Europe tests at a temperature, a relatively high temperature of 60 degrees Celsius, centigrade or Celsius, whereas India tests at room, air, at room temperature, uh, with, which in India is higher than it is in many other places. Um, still, the results are quite incomparable. Trivial, perhaps, but very important. One aspect that we've really pulled out of the mix in this study that I think is a, is a major element and major contribution that this study is making to this field is to separate out test procedures and efficiency metrics. Uh, you may think they're the same, and well, we thought that also for some time, and then we decided to disentangle them. An efficiency metric, in our view, is the formula that determines how a test result calculates into an energy performance level. Um, Obvious ones include, for example, refrigerators where you do a test over a 24-hour cycle or some days. You come up with an energy demand and you calculate that in some way into an annual energy demand that is used in many regulations. That, that is one example of an efficiency metric. There are, there are more examples, of course. The relevance of this is that even if that test procedures are the same, if all countries use the same, say, the same IEC test procedure for a product, for example, television, the efficiency metric may still be different. For example, Europe and the US test their test procedures using the same IEC test procedure as Australia does. The difference is that where Europe and the US then calculate an, a daily energy demand, um, Australia calculates, sorry, 
calculate a what the, a, a power demand. Australia then calculates a daily energy demand and calculates that onto an annual energy demand, which makes these results a little bit harder to compare. Um, energy performance levels, the thresholds that a product's efficiency must meet. Um, it, in a way, that's the value everyone looks at. In this country, a product is allowed to use this many kilowatt hours. In that country, it's allowed to use that many kilowatt hours. In, in a way, very easy um, to compare because it's two numbers, and if one number is larger than the other, then the allowed, allowable energy demand is higher than in the other case. In the other case, then again, that performance level reflects the efficiency metrics, the test procedures, and product definitions that are underpinning it. So the number in itself is not that, not always that informative. And the final component, the the MAPS minimum energy performance standards and labels themselves. These are the actual regulations that that governments adopt. Um, governments determine regulations, product requirements. They put these down in maps and label requirements, uh, and suppliers usually have to live up to those regulations. They again include the performance levels, the efficiency metrics, the test procedures, and the product definitions that underpin all of that. And sometimes that's obvious. Sometimes that's always clearly defined, and in many cases it isn't. Could I have the next slide, please. So what I'd like to talk about now for, for a little bit is what we've done to compare test procedures and efficiency metrics and more importantly what we found. And to do that we've been mapping test procedures and efficiency metrics, we've been analyzing them in, in, in a bit of detail, comparing them to IEC and ISO test procedures and other international test procedures and a relevant factor in fact, might be that in some cases ISO and IEC are not the relevant international test procedures. For example, for many electronic products, the US Energy Star test procedures serve as the de facto international standards that everyone looks at and everyone compares with. Um, we've been, then been looking at converting the test procedures. So if I measure 100 kilowatt hours a year in one test procedure, or I measure a power demand of 100 watts in one test procedure, how much would that be if I used a different test procedure? And in, in some cases, it was possible to develop those conversion factors. In some cases, it wasn't, and you'll see more of that later on in the slides. And finally, we've been comparing the results of that. Could I have the next slide, please? So to give you a first overview, um, we've been looking at the alignment of test procedures and efficiency metrics for various product areas. And in our, in our study, we identify nine product areas, lighting, consumer electronics and ICT, transformers, which is a pretty small uh, product area consisting of one product, distribution transformers, uh, motors, pumps and fans, household appliances, air conditioning equipment, commercial refrigeration equipment, cooking products and space and water heating equipment. And we've been looking at the level of alignment within each of these areas to see if some product areas show more alignment than other product areas, and they do, as you can see. Those alignment scores have a complicated calculation behind them, which is explained in more detail in the report, and I won't bore you with all the details, just to say that we've been looking at how comparable individual product regulations and test procedures and efficiency metrics are. Um, giving those a score, that includes also the robustness of the conversion, is it a reliable conversion, is it a bit of a shaky conversion, and that is also reflected in our report in some scores. And, and so you won't be, find any surprises where we pretend that a very shaky conversion is actually a quite robust one. If it is shaky, we say it is shaky. Um, with all the scores for individual products, they've obviously been added up, averaged out, uh, de de depending on how many products there are in an area, and that gives you an average score for that area. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, what you then see if you look at product areas is that some obviously show more alignment than others, and this probably will not come as a big surprise, but the lighting product area shows a lot of alignment. Test procedures and efficiency metrics between economies are reasonably well aligned already. And on the other end of the scale, for space and water heating, it's quite different. There's hardly any alignment between economies. Uh, the test procedure in one economy is probably quite different from test procedure in another economy for virtually every space and water heating product. The fact that lighting products are so much more aligned may partly be the result of, 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 of coordinated efforts to get there. Uh, and CFLs, for example, are one, one area where there has been some of that coordinated efforts. LEDs uh, is one area where there have been coordinated efforts. 
But a bigger factor to us seems to be that the products themselves are actually comparable. A CFL in India is the same as a CFL in, in, in Europe, is the same as a CFL in the US, except for small voltage differences. Um, whereas a heating product in India is very different from a heating product in the US. The, the system itself is, is, is simply different. A typical US for, uh, heating furnace is not something you usually find in Europe, for example, whereas a typical European hot water heating system is not something you typically find in the US. That alone makes it hard to align test procedures. If the products are very different, the test procedures and the efficiency metrics can't really be aligned. Now, you see the same in terms of comparable products within the consumer electronics and ICT area. ICT products in particular are globally traded, are very much the same across the world, um, which makes it a whole lot easier to align test procedures and efficiency metrics. It kind of comes naturally for those areas. Plus, of course, the dominant, the dominant influence of U.S. Energy Star in electronics. Um, we talked about transformers, where there's a lot of alignment. Motors, pumps, and fans is actually an area where there's a lot of alignment. Probably partly because motors are again internationally traded products, very comparable around the world. But there also have been quite powerful uh, international efforts to make sure that motor test procedures and efficiency metrics are aligned through IEC. And we'll talk about more, more about that in a minute. As, as an example of what you can achieve in terms of alignment and what the benefits might be, household appliances are a bit of an, of an odd category. Um, we can align and compare performance for household appliances quite well across economies, largely because these products have been regulated for so long that we really understand the differences. Whereas the products themselves, in some cases, are quite different. They, top-loading washing machine, as is common in, for example, the US, but also in Australia. Um, it's, it's not exactly the same product as a front-loading machine, which is far more common in Europe, for example, or also in India. Um, washing in cold water, as is common in India and sometimes also Australia, is quite different from washing in hot water, as is common in the US and Europe. And, and those differences come into play there, that the products are actually quite different. Um, but we understand the differences so well that we can still say more, a lot more about how Align how, how comparable products are internationally. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Air conditioning is an interesting area. The test procedures there are actually pretty well aligned, and there's been some international efforts to make that happen. What we've seen in recent years is that virtually every economy is moving towards seasonal energy efficiency performance metrics. And the downside of that is that whereas the testing itself is quite comparable, the efficiency metrics actually differ a lot. And what, what was a, a very aligned area and a very comparable area maybe only five years ago actually isn't so comparable anymore. Commercial refrigeration equipment is an area that is very much in development. Um, many new products that are being regulated for the first time in, in, in various economies, not that many economies yet. And um, that procedures and efficiency metrics are still a bit under development for that area. The same for cooking products, which is a fairly new area in terms of standards and labels and space and water heating, I mentioned it before, an area where most of the products themselves are actually quite different. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Now, some examples of, of, of standard labels policy and comparability and how, how easy it is, how relevant it is. Um, I mentioned CFLs, compact fluorescent lamps before, a great example of international alignment. Um, test procedures are the same, efficiency metrics are aligned. The products themselves are very comparable. Basically, the only thing that's not aligned are the actual performance requirements. Um, various countries define CFL performance in exactly the same way and still have a different efficacy, lamp efficacy that needs to come out in order to comply with the regulations. Um, that might be an area where there's potential for movement, which could increase the global market for better products. Pump systems and motor systems are good examples of what can be done through international organizations, uh, ISO and IEC, for example. And what you see there is that there have been great efforts internationally to define test procedures that includes not only product definition, but also test conditions, um, the whole test procedure, energy efficiency metrics, and in some cases even energy performance levels. Not energy performance levels that motors, for example, have to comply with, but energy performance levels that countries can align to. And you see that a lot in the motors area, where there are basically four international efficiency levels, uh, five now I believe, and the new one has been defined that countries can choose to use as their standards or label level. And that seems to be working pretty well. 
The next slide, please. Um, unfortunately, we also see some areas of non-alignment and, and sometimes some really small things where alignment would be really easy and might actually help with larger markets for energy efficient products, um, which is still not happening. Uh, one example we stumbled upon are directional lamps. Um, everything is the same for directional lamps in terms of test procedure, the efficiency metric, except, except for one thing. The, the shape of the cone that you use to measure the lights with is different in Europe than in other economies. Now, that seems like a small thing. It probably is a small thing. Still, it matters an awful lot because it renders any test result that you have uncomparable between the EU and other economies. And the EU is one of the large economies that's, that partly determine global markets. Um, it, it, it's the little things that matter, basically. And this is really one example of the little things. The room air conditioners, I mentioned that before, the um, efficiency metrics are really diverging there, where some countries choose where all economies are choosing seasonal efficiency performance metrics and all economies are choosing different factors in that performance metric. Now, that really reduces comparability. That's interesting from an analytical perspective, maybe not so much from a policy or market perspective. It also means, however, that products need to be designed in different ways to meet performance requirements because some countries emphasize latent heat removal potential, some countries emphasize partial load conditions, some countries emphasize a, a mix of partial load, full load conditions, and all those different mixes probably require a different product optimization to perform best under the conditions that the country defines. Um, there, there may be good reasons for those differences. It, it does mean that different products are needed for different economies, and the global market for the most efficient product is probably smaller than it might be otherwise. Mm, televisions is, are an interesting example. Um, we always think of televisions having one of the most aligned test procedures and efficiency metrics in the world. And, and in a way, that's true. There is a global IEC test procedure which was, was developed through international efforts. The way you test energy efficiency for television has been defined internationally. And yet, recently, we've seen that their diversion is setting in around the automatic broadcast control and how you measure and evaluate that. And it looks like television, te television energy performance is becoming less comparable than it was before. It probably also means that different countries, again, will need different optimizations to best meet the performance requirements in their country. And that can mean that the global market for the best televisions may be less optimal than it could be otherwise. The next slide, please. One other comparison we've done is, is the alignment by, by economy to see to what extent one country is aligned most to all the other countries, to the, average, to the other countries together and see what we see then. And if you look at the scale, ranging from Australia to Mexico, to the EU, to the US, to China, to India, to South Africa, to Indonesia, and to Russia, in, in terms of decreasing alignment. Um, the scores, by the way, the numbers themselves don't have an absolute meaning. It's, it's a relative score. What, what, what you see there, what we think we see there, is that Australia and Mexico have made the deliberate choice to align their test procedures and efficiency metrics as much as possible with other economies. In Australia, that, basic, that, that typically is the, either the European or the, Austra the US test procedure efficiency metric, whatever is most applicable for the products they're dealing with. In Mexico, that's typically the, the US uh, test procedure efficiency metric, and it shows um, it, it shows that since that deliberate that deliberate policy is to align, that alignment shows up in our results. Of course, the EU and US follow that, and probably for an interesting reason, neither the EU or the US have a policy of aligning their test procedures and efficiency metrics so much with other economies. They have a policy to align with IEC and ISO standards where that is, where that is feasible, where that matches the, the needs of the country well. Um, still, EU and US show a lot of alignment, basically because they're leading economies. Um, if a product has never been touched by standards and labels before, the first economy to touch it typically is either the EU or the US. And if you're the first, you're likely to set a standard, and that's what shows up here. Many products are tackled first in the EU and the US. That sets a standard, and other countries tag on to that. China and India, two developing countries that are rapidly evolving standards and labels programs, they typically look at major economies, EU, US, sometimes Australia, sometimes Japan, uh, and, and also their own needs, um, both India and China align and adapt their, the standards and labels to the best 
to better meet the needs of the country. And, and there are climatic differences, there are cultural differences, there are market differences, which make it necessary sometimes to adapt to the needs. And that shows in a somewhat lower alignment score. Uh, South Africa and Indonesia have developing standards and labels programs. Many things are in development, are not yet fully defined yet, therefore not so comparable and not so aligned yet. Uh, and we can't say how that will evolve over the next years. I would expect that if the programs evolve as they seem to be evolving and have been evolving for years, the alignment will go up over time. And Russia really has a program in transition, uh, moving from using old Russian cost standards to more alignment with IEC, ISO, sometimes EU standards. And that is showing up that Russia is really a program in transition where many things are moving and not much is, is set in stone yet. And with that, I'd like to hand over back to Mia, who will tell more about policy coverage and stringency. Thanks, Frank. So we're looking next at um, policy coverage and stringency. So the number of policies, the number of products that are covered, and how ambitious they are. Having gathered all of these policies, and we're now in a position to convert between the, the results of different standards and test procedure results, we then compared the policy coverage, so that's the number of products covered by standards and labels, and how stringent the requirements are of those standards and of the label classes. So could we move on to the next slide, please? So this is about coverage, and uh, it's, there's been an interesting shift in terms of coverage and what you might expect. Traditionally, the US led on maps and the EU on labels. And now the situation is different. It's been reversed. So the EU eco-design program has been very active and has taken on a lot of new products. And it's now overtaken the US in terms of MEPS coverage. And the US has overtaken the EU in terms of labels. I should probably specify here that in terms of labels, what we mean in the US is we're referring to Energy Star labels. Um, and there's nothing that in our report that refers to the US what, there's no none of none of the products in our reports that have energy star labels don't have energy guide labels. I should probably say that clearer. All of the products in our reports that have energy star labels also have energy guide labels. So if you looked at it on that basis, it wouldn't be different. So so that's the interesting shift. In China, we looked at the categorical label. And China also has an endorsement mark, but largely products with the endorsement mark also have the categorical label, which is the leading label in China. And what we see here is a result of China working really hard at expanding the scope of its SNL program. The rest of the list, um, I'm probably going to give you similar information to what Frank just gave you on alignment, but Australia is doing good work and has solid coverage. Probably not as many labels as I would personally have expected, but um, still very sound in, in fourth place in terms of coverage. Uh, Mexico and India are building their coverage by generally copying from other economies. So India copies from a variety of economies and Mexico mainly from the US and sometimes old standards. And as Frank mentioned, Russia is in transition, but moving towards EU standards and test procedures. And Indonesia and South Africa are still developing their programs. Internationally, CICT, household appliances, and space and water heating are the most regulated product areas. All of those have over 45 SNL regulations. They're closely followed by lighting which has 39 regulations, then motors, fans, and pumps with 38, and commercial refrigeration products with 34. For cooking products and AC, the numbers are lower at uh, 26 and 25 regulations each, and transformers, which are kind of a smaller and more distinct product area, have six regulations. So there's a lot more detail that's available on this in the report. And 
the EU obviously have consistently have also have wider SNL coverage across all product areas, with China and Australia following closely. Mexico seems to be focusing on lighting and commercial refrigeration products, and South Africa primarily on household appliances. And unsurprisingly, household appliances are still the only product area with SNL regulations in every economy in our analysis, because generally household appliances are the starting point for new economies. So if we move on to the next slide, we look at the ambition levels. So the most ambitious maps and labels. And as I mentioned on the slide before, the EU EcoDesign has been really active and taken on a lot of new products. And it really stands out as the clear leader in SNL development. So it's kind of one to watch. Not only does it have the largest number of maps, as we saw on the previous slide, but also the most ambitious maps and labels for more than half of the SNL products, and many of those are unique. So for 9 out of 18 comparable maps, and for 9 out of 15 comparable labels. So if economies in transition should really watch what's going on in the EU. And then we see that Australia follows the EU with three most ambitious maps and five labels and then the US with five and one. And I won't, I won't bore you by going through the rest of the table, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, could we move on to the next slide? So yeah, alignment by economy can be complicated, and there are a number of differences among economies that contribute to variations in policy coverage and stringency. And these are listed here, energy prices, product ownership, product usage patterns, they should be reasonably familiar. They lead to different economic assessments from country to country. The next slide looks at future directions. And if we, look, we looked at the potential for alignment between different products uh, across different economies. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the, all products have a potential for increased alignment, but this can mean different things for different products. So at individual product level, we did this on this product-by-product product basis, and this is the, the example for the CICT area, where various products are aligned to various degrees and having different potential for alignment in the future. If we see in the blue, we have computers and imaging equipment. They're already aligned internationally both in terms of efficiency metrics and in terms of test procedures. Then less aligned, we go to the green areas, are TVs, displays, and external power supplies. They already have aligned test procedures, and there's potential to align efficiency metrics in the future. And then we go to the red, which is the least aligned, and that's the set-top boxes here, both the simple ones and the complex ones, and servers. It's really hard to align test procedures and standards in these areas, but it may be possible to align certain components of these test procedures. So that's what the red means. So if, if we look across all of these areas, we see that across the whole of the CICT area, there's quite a wide range of alignment potential. If we could move on to the next slide. So the next slide takes us up a level, and, and in the report there's detail for each one of the areas, the, the, the product areas, and for each of the products. And this is an amalgamation of those areas. So if, if you look at the CICT line, you'll see the three kind of colors that we, we just talked through in the previous slide. Uh, so this gives an overview 
and then we, we drew the products together by product area so that we could have an indication of the potential across the area. And this chart shows in block colors essentially how we drew together the individual sub-products alignment into broader product areas. And then the arrows give you the overall range. So again, if we focus on the CICT, we see the range is wide, the widest of all, and it goes across all of the potential for alignment. And Frank's going to give you a bit more detail on these product areas. Thank you again, Mia. Um, if you look at household appliances and our assessment of the alignment potential there, how much is possible in household appliances, you'll see the range indeed from red to orange, and that largely reflect, reflect differences between the products. Um, household appliances are not that comparable product-wise around the world. Um, the other aspect that comes into play there is, is how ingrained test procedures are and how interwoven test procedures are with product design. And, and for some products, uh, the test procedure really defines how you design the product in an optimal way for an economy. And our experience is that if test procedure is so ingrained in product design, if the differences are so, lo so large between products, and if that product has been around for a long time, test procedures have been in use for a long time, they are really hard to change, so we put that potential relatively low for further alignment. doesn't mean nothing can happen, but we estimate that it's not the most promising area for alignment. If you then look at the lighting area, for example, you see that test procedures are already pretty well aligned. Um, there is potential to align performance efficiency, energy efficiency metrics. Um, and, and we believe that that's the case because the differences in general are not so big that the products are more comparable in the lighting area, that the changes that would be needed to also align efficiency metrics are relatively small to make and, and possibly relatively easy to make. The consumer electronics ICT area, we had just discussed that, so I'm, I'm going to skip that one now. Um, air conditioning is an interesting area. The test procedures are pretty well aligned. Efficiency metrics, in theory, could be aligned further because every economy uses the same test points or somewhat the same test points and uses somewhat similar ways of defining energy efficiency for an air, condition, air conditioner. However, air conditioning seasonal efficiency requirements are also reflective of climatic conditions and we expect that those climatic conditions will always come into play and that economies do want to have a seasonal efficiency metric that really reflects the specific circumstances of that economy. The space and water heating equipment, generally we consider that space and water heating equipment is, is quite different between economies, that the products show large variations, that the test procedures where they exist show large variations, that it will not be easy to align those test procedures fully. Um, there is one exception around electric heating where we believe that it's a lot easier to align test procedures and possibly efficiency metrics there. There's still some way to go there also probably, but still. It, it should be a lot easier than for most non-electric heating equipment. Um, com commercial refrigeration equipment, we talked a little bit about it before. It's a relatively new area. There are not that many CRE products that, 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 that are important in that area. And, and the ones that are around are somewhat comparable around the world. Another, uh, another aspect that really helps in our assessment that the potential for alignment is relatively big is that not many economies have well-defined as an L for commercial refrigeration equipment. And, and because things are still moving, it's probably easier to align things there and, and increase the market for better commercial refrigeration equipment. Cooking products, on the other hand, a, a bit like heating equipment, um, the products vary a lot around the world. Test procedures, as far as they are existing, are very different. And there doesn't seem to be that much interest around the world in aligning as an L for cooking products, partly probably because they're not so much traded internationally. Um, the, the, the market for cooking products, as, to, as is the market for space and water heating products, is still largely national, sometimes regional, at the regional econ economy scale. It is not so much a global market as it is for many other products. The motors, pumps and fans area, um, a large variation within that area. Some products are already fully or almost fully aligned. Uh, motors um, is, is one where the IEC test procedure defines virtually everything up to performance levels. The only thing not defined in the IEC test procedures 
are the actual regulations and the actual performance levels that products have to meet in a given economy, and, and that's not something you can align internationally. Um, there are there, there's probably potential for more products in the motor pumps and fans area. For pumps, developments are underway. For fans, it may be possible for more products than we think right now to align this further. The distribution transformers is is is, is one product. Um, the test procedure is already aligned, and it's probably possible to also align the efficiency metrics for distribution transformers, which would make it easier to trade distribution transformers internationally. Would probably also make it easier to transfer efficient technologies more quickly and more rapidly and more easily from one economy to the next. Could I have the next slide, please? Thank you. And with that in mind, we thought about if we were to give this audience a few practical options. Say someone would like to start working tomorrow on more alignment of test procedures, efficiency metrics that would really benefit energy efficiency around the world. A few things that might be possible and by no means an, an extensive or exhaustive list. Um, for directional lighting, start looking at the cone shape that is used in testing directional lighting. Aligning that might make that area a lot easier to address. Um, for all item products, start looking at generic performance levels that define the efficacy and quality characteristics that lighting has to meet in order to either meet a standard performance level or an, an energy label class. Um, doesn't have to be the same. It doesn't have to be one performance level around the world. Uh, in, in light, in, especially for lighting products, there's experience with defining a few performance levels, and countries and economies can choose the performance level that best meets their, need, meets their needs. For televisions, we talked about it before, uh, automatic brightness control is, is kind of putting a spanner in the wheel there and it would really make sense for economies to start talking about how you regulate automatic brightness control and not all of them doing something about it individually. External power supplies, uh, test procedures, again, are well aligned. Performance levels are not. and The products are quite similar in various economies. You often see actually external power supplies that meet the performance requirements of various economies, yet performance levels as they are required, as they are defined in standards or set out in, in standards and labor requirements vary quite a bit. And it, it may add a complication that the market really doesn't need, because the market probably is better off focusing on delivering the best energy performance for the lowest cost and not on playing with the particular the particularities of various standards and labels in various economies. We talked about some CRE products before. Refrigerated cabinets and refrigerated display cabinets probably show the biggest potential for further alignment. Um, there's a lot of movement around these products. The products themselves seem to be quite comparable around the world. Not many economies have test procedures, efficiency metrics, and standards and labels in place for them. Many are developing them. And it seems a perfect opportunity to agree common test conditions, agree energy efficiency metrics that all countries can work with, and really move this area forward. And various types of fans and pumps, and it's not the same across the whole area, but there are various types which seem very promising. It should be possible to agree common efficiency, energy efficiency metrics and maybe also common performance metrics and performance levels for these products that, again, could really help in increasing the global market for energy efficient products. And with that, I'd like to conclude our overview of findings and hand over to Debbie for some final comments. Thank you, Frank and Mia. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, so to speak about some future opportunities um, on the research side, so Frank just spoke about future opportunities on the alignment side uh, with policies in particular. Uh, this, as we said, as I said at the beginning, uh, this study is a, uh, follows or builds on a study that um, Klaus did in 2011. And we also plan to do future research along these same lines. Uh, the first two bullet points here both are about um, highlighting opportunities for, for um, undertaking these concrete uh, opportunity improvements that Frank was just discussing, both collaboration uh, with specific countries as well as opportunities for international organizations such as IEC and ISO to lead the way. We also, the next two, uh, we are thinking to examine the costs and benefits from adopting more ambitious policies, uh, one of the benefits including energy savings potentials, 
um, as well as the costs and benefits of filling, filling any gaps in policy coverage. And finally, looking at a different angle on the, on the same topic, which is looking at the costs, what are the costs to industry and governments of having non-aligned test methods? And these are all potential research lines that we're thinking about right now, and we certainly welcome feedback on these future research directions. We want to make sure that we build on the impressive technical research that has been done to this point in the ways that are the most useful for creating impact and affecting improvements in both the alignment of SNL components and product energy efficiency through SNL. Next slide, please. So again, everyone should have received an email with this link, um, but I just want to highlight that all of the resources uh, or all the resources that we have created to date on this topic are available on www.clasponline.org slash IGC. And that these include the full report, which is um, actually about 60 pages. It's a really interesting read, in my opinion. Uh, there's also a policymaker summary, um, which you'll see the, the charts and graphs that you've seen in this presentation, you'll see in the policymaker summary as well and two annexes. One is an overview table, which is an Excel file containing quantitative information about the conversions and the levels of the MEPs and the high labels that we were talking about. And annex two, the product fact sheets, is um, an incredible resource, especially if you're looking for product-specific detailed information. Um, this document is uh, divided out by product categories. So there are nine product categories plus a sort of miscellaneous one to catch one or two that didn't fit, um, and includes just a lot of information about what the, uh, what the regulations are in each of these economies, how they compare, so there's a table comparing each of them, and then what the global situation is and some of the background and, and context for each product. Um, and it, again, it's broken out by product category, but within that it really dives into each product in particular, and this is, um, Again, a great resource, especially for uh, technical people who are looking for product-specific information. I really encourage you to look there. Uh, next slide. So thank you all very much. Uh, this is the contact information for myself and Mia and Frank, and we encourage you to reach out both with um, any questions or comments, with ideas on future research, um, anything related to this at all. We really uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue and moving forward this, this line of research. Uh, Sean, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you. And uh, thank you to each of the panelists for those great presentations. Um, and at this point, we will move on to the question and answer session involving the audience. So if any of our attendees today have questions for the panelists, uh, please submit those through the question pane and I will present it uh, to them for discussion. And so um, I'd like to start with the first question. And that question um, is, how did you select the economies? Um, hi, yeah, we, we had the original four economies from the previous study. And then, basically, it's described in, in quite some detail in the report. We used a number of criteria, but most of the criteria are mainly focused around the potential for impact for the additional economies. So, in particular, we looked at CO2 mitigation potential. And, as I mentioned before, in the end, we decided to go for a broader coverage, so including more economies than originally planned, even where there was less information available. Um, but yeah, it, there's, a, there's a description of all of the individual criteria used in, in, the, in the report. But they center around the potential for CO2 mitigation. Great, thank you. Uh, and moving on to the next question. One of our attendees didn't catch the uh, label types that were included for the US. And they're wondering, were the Energy Guide and Energy Star labels included? And they note that uh, they were under the impression that Energy Star covered over 70 products. So if you look at the products that we, we cover, although we cover a lot of products, we cover over 100 products, we don't cover every single product in existence because um, I I, I'm not sure that that study would have been possible. 
So it, it may well be that Energy Star overall covers many more products than are listed in, in the table that we showed. Um, in terms of the labels, for, for the US, we looked at Energy Star. And then we did a check to make sure to see whether there were any additional products that were covered by the energy guide label that weren't covered by Energy Star, because we were looking for the highest label, so obviously that would be Energy Star. And there were no products that out of the ones that we select that, that we were looking at that were that had an energy guide label but didn't have an energy star label. Also, probably worth noting that Energy Star and, and its labels covers some building products as well. So, uh, so, so we didn't cover any building products. Hope, hopefully, that's clear and that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next question that re I received, um, and they wonder: Are there any product alignments? for small island developing states who do not manufacture or assemble appliances. They note that uh, Mexico appears to be the nearest economy. There are many. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure Mexico appears to be the nearest economy. It really depends on the, the, the country itself, I think. And what many economies do is they check which economy most aligns with their markets and with the products. Um, from where they import most of the products or with which market their, their, their national market is most aligned. And uh, for, for many countries in Northern Africa, for example, that's the EU. For Mexico, that's the US. So it probably makes more sense to check which market is, is most aligned with the market in the country than to, to look at the country that, that does most in aligning with another economy. Great. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> And for the next question, uh, with respect to lighting, what is your recommendation about how to ensure that the needs of countries that do not have SNL programs are considered in alignment processes that can affect product design? So for example, robustness of LED products in light of large grid fluctuations in ambient temperatures in many developing countries. That, that is a really interesting question, and it's um, it, it's it's interesting question for lighting. It's an interesting question in general. Um, how to represent the interests of countries that are not even aware of the fact that in future they might need a standard test procedure for a specific products, and as relevant as it is for lighting, and as relevant as it is for LED, I think the answer is is kind of similar for all products. Um, when developing global standards and labels, you need to factor in that not only um, countries with a, with a very well established SNL program use these standards. They need to be applicable to all countries in the world. And what you typically see is that global manufacturers play a big role in standards made in, in test proceeding development. Excuse me. And it is in their interest to make sure that whatever is developed also works for new markets. Having said that, um, it, it, it does make more sense to focus on markets that actually use test procedures, so the ones that do have standards and latest programs. It, it wouldn't necessarily make much sense to develop that procedure that may be applicable to countries 20 years from now when they get to the point when they want to have a standards and latest program for a given product, when that test procedure might be obsolete by that time. So I, I, that, that may not fully answer the question, it's more a line of thinking that you need to factor this in, in the work, um, even if there is no representative of, of an economy. It's, it's, that, that typically is a problem that if a country doesn't have an SNL program, may not even know that it has an SNL program, it's really hard to factor in their needs because there's no one representing those needs. So it, it will depend on global participants to really pay attention to that. Uh, I'd just like to add a little one thing to that on lighting in particular. Um, what we've seen is that in addition to the international, uh, well, the in-process in international development of international standards for LEDs, um, there also have been regional developments. So for instance, there's a program called Lights Asia um, that has put in place testing and requirements specifically for tropical environments. And so this takes into account some of these conditions. Um, and in the case of LEDs, it's interesting because that's coming out at the same time as the international standards are being developed. 
um, but potentially for other products uh, could lead to some sort of a divergence in testing that then would have to be you know, revisited if you wanted to create a new aligned standard. But I think that those sort of regional developments can help pave the way uh, for the sort of future pathway for, the, for that product category. Great. Thank you both for the, uh, the response. And <clears throat> the next question I'm going to move on to, um, bear with me, is, uh, it has uh, some pretext to it. And if you need me to repeat anything, I'll be happy to do so. And so the attending notes that, uh, as Frank and Mia stated, a number of products, uh, for a number of products, there's a di desire to harmonize either test methods, metrics, and or performance levels across a number of economies. Um, however, the test methods performance or slash performance metrics that industry desire and appear prepared to make in the ISO IEC standards committees may not align with the requirements of the regulator or may, may make regulatory implementation almost impossible. So for example, Frank mentioned that CFL standards and regulations were quite well aligned, yet to undertake enforcement testing of a single CFL model could easily be $5,000 simply because the standards committee have insisted sample sizes are 20 lamps. Uh, what are Frank and Mia's uh, via uh, opinion on how to balance the needs of industry and the regulator, and how can the regulator actually influence the outcomes from the industry-led standards panels? I obviously can't answer for me, yes, I'll get my answer and let me add to that. Um, it's an excellent question. Um, there is no full answer that I know of. I know that some regulators have been struggling with this question for a while. Um, one thing regulators could easily do is actually show up for meetings where test procedures are being discussed. Because I know that the usual practice is that there are 10, 15, 20 industry representatives who take this quite seriously, and if you're lucky, one or two government representatives participating in meetings where test procedures are being discussed. And that may not reflect how important test procedures are for regulators. So simply paying more attention to this could be a good start. Um, the other thing is that it may be good to have a discussion with the test procedure bodies, the standardization bodies, IEC, ISO, uh, about this and, and maybe discuss how governments could take a larger role in test procedure development and maybe also take a more of a leading role and help in defining the characteristics that a test procedure needs to meet. Because often test procedure development starts with a blank sheet basically. There is no requirement except give us a test procedure. Well, if your question is undefined, what you're going to get meets your requirements. So, so thinking about what a test procedure actually needs to do from a regulatory perspective and telling standardization organizations what that is might also help. And, and I'm sure there are many more recommendations and, and many more solutions. These, these two might already make a start. Yes, yeah, anything you'd like to add to that? I think my answer was going to be along the same lines, but um, I, I would have phrased it differently more in terms of collaboration, sort of increased collaboration between governments and those, uh, those creating the test standards. And, and really kind of on a basic level, making sure that within this increased collaboration, the, the, the governments make sure that they listen to all of the stakeholders' views, so around the whole spectrum in, in understanding whether the test procedure meets their le needs and, and, and keeps on discussing that. And, and it's difficult for governments, I understand, because of limited resources. But it's it's the test procedures are obviously incredibly important and kind of like the bedrock of of standards and labels. So uh, definitely worthwhile and definitely important for them to engage more fully. Um, Sean, I would just like to add that the um, there are several initiatives working together actually on this, uh, which include the Seed Initiative. IEA, 4E, and IEA, and the governments within these initiatives have identified this need as well and are working with IEC and ISO to come up with a solution. Um, so it's a really good question and I think uh, something that we're starting to, to try to work towards. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, 
And so we'll move on to the next question, uh, which uh, switching tracks a little bit asks, how do you define most ambitious and unique most ambitious? Um, most ambitious is we, we've looked at the level and we've said this is the highest level. And then sometimes there were levels that were tied. So that's included in that number. So for example, there was nine of some of them in the EU, but eight were unique. So when they're unique, they're not tied with any other country. They're the only ones who have the highest standard. Great, thank you. Uh, and next quick question uh, is asking specifically about motors. And it notes that countries are aligning to IEC standards for motors, uh, particularly IE3 and IE4. Uh, so what is the relevance of separate nation-specific labeling, given that motor consumers are mostly industry itself, and who are already aligned to IEC standards? A good question again. And the, the relevance really is that IEC standards in themselves have no legal meaning. Um, IEC may define something as an IE3 level or an IE4 level. That doesn't mean that industry itself has to live up to that. Um, if, if a country wouldn't specify an IEC standard as, as, as a labeling level in a country, anyone could just put IE3 or whatever they want and start marketing it as an IE3 motor and really confusing the market. So it's a legal backing that you need to these, these test, international test procedures that, that only a country can provide. Great, thanks again, Frank. Um, and our next question asks, uh, when we speak about comparing, we speak also about mutual recognition, for example, and do you think that a scheme, like for safety with CB scheme, is imaginable? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. That's fine. Um, understand it fully? Me, me, me. W would whoever asked the question, would you be able to clarify? Yeah, uh, the attendee that submitted that, if you'd like to uh, just reword that and submit it again, I'd be more than happy to present it to the panelists for you. Um, so we'll move on to the next question, and if that one pops up, I'll, I'll jump to that one. Um, and so the next question that we received uh, asks, regarding the statement made on TVs and the need to harmonize on ABC approaches, uh, some variation in calculation of on mode with ABC can be explained by regional differences in ambient lighting conditions, which mean that ABC behaves differently, resulting in different savings. Where do you think the line is between achieving harmonization and the need for regional tailoring of approaches? So, um, Sean, can I... I'm going to let the, the, all of the participants in on, on a little secret that uh, I asked Sean if he would send me the questions. And I see there are a few questions that touch on the same topic, which are kind of what's the benefit of alignment versus being more precise with the specific conditions in a local area or in a local economy. And I think that's that's the heart of, of this question. So maybe we can we can answer a few of those questions together. How does that sound to Frank and Debbie? Sounds good. Sure. And would you like me to read those questions first or do you want to just go ahead and um, approach that topic? Sure, maybe we, maybe if you can pick them out, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Uh, the, I think the next question that you're referring to that's related is, is alignment always relevant? Um, and then, um, well, and I think, I think you're right. I think that basic, uh, basic question um, is prevalent through several of these. So um, if you want to go ahead and address that issue. So the, the the question about what's the where to draw the line between 
looking at, at, at regional specifics, re regional characteristics, and, and tailoring to that versus global organization. It, I'm not sure it has one answer. Both are needed. Um, you do want standards and labels to be representative of the specific circumstances and economy. Um, at the same time, it, it seems to help global markets if best procedures, efficiency metrics, sometimes performance levels are aligned and more, effect, more efficient and more effective global markets can deliver efficiency at better costs usually. Um, for a specific product, you'll have to do the analysis and you'll have to look at it in, in, in greater detail, I think, than we can do in this call. More in general, what we see is that there, there's often a lot, of, a lot of talk about tailoring standards and labels to a regional market and looking at the characteristics and how, how different product use is. Um, that usually looks at average use and average values and it kind of ignores that within an economy there's a lot of variation. And I wouldn't be surprised if when, when people start looking at this in greater detail, they'll see that the, the similarities between product use and conditions in a country or between economies are actually larger than the differences that appear to be so relevant when you look at averages. And if, if for example, on, on televisions, uh, ABC, lighting conditions, um, light conditions are different in different people's homes uh, within an economy. They're also different on average between economies. I think that the overlap is actually larger than the difference. And on many products that are globally traded, there are probably much benefits to harmonization. On products that are mainly traded within a region, the benefits may be lower. Um, a final answer would probably depend on doing the analysis for a region and with everything in mind. Also looking at cost and benefits, of course, because um, energy prices are also different between economies. Product prices are different, usage are diff is different, uh, hours of use, types of use, uh, how products are used in a household. There, there is not one single answer that covers everything. And I think a detailed analysis is needed when you actually get to the final standard and labels. And that is common practice in most economies to do a detailed analysis before you actually set a regulation. So the system seems to work. I also want to add that, as Frank just mentioned, uh, the cost and benefits in terms of both the energy and the, and the money savings um, or costs, that's one of the uh, additional sort of follow-on pieces of research that we're looking to do. So we don't have um, an updated assessment of that. There is some of that in the 2011 study, um, but we're planning to do an updated assessment of that for particular countries of interest and looking at particular products of interest. Um, and that will provide more information about sort of the concrete benefits of alignment. And to complement that, we're thinking about potentially doing research on the cost of non-alignment, because that's not really something you capture in a cost, like what are the costs and benefits of aligning, um, doesn't necessarily capture what are the costs of not aligning, or I suppose benefits. Um, and so those are two different pieces of research that we're um, thinking about, and if you have thoughts on that, please do feel welcome to contact me. All right, thank you. Uh uh, uh, Frank and, and Mia for that. And so we do have a, a related question that may have uh, just been been touched on, but want to make sure that uh, it's addressed directly. So it, um, it does ask, is alignment always relevant and have some cost benefits in terms of energy and money savings been made? And did the team pick out some key conditions to make alignment beneficial? I think most of that. Um, is I, we, we probably have. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, most of it has probably been discussed already, indeed. Um, and, and no, alignment is not always relevant. It usually is a relevant factor to look at. I would say it's not always. It's so on that sense, it probably always gets relevant. It may not necessarily be the best thing to do. And indeed, looking at custom benefits um, and, and how to make it work are things to look at in, in specific circumstances. Yeah, you're yeah. always going to want to to look at what's going on in the rest of the world, what other people have done before in an area, but you're not necessarily going to think that it fits for your area. And and did we pick out key conditions? Uh, we didn't. That's not included in the report. We we just looked at how to how to do the conversions and the other things that that we've mentioned. Great, thanks again, guys. I'm going to skip ahead now. We did have our, our attendee resubmit their question, um, reworded it. And so let me read through this. 
and it says uh, it asks the CB scheme allows uh, to produce a test report internationally recognized by IEC members with national deviation. Producer pay only for one test reports. Producers pay only for one test reports, which include all the deviations in which allow them to obtain related certifications. Is the same approach imaginable in FES? Um, would it be which kind of body would head that? Um, thank you for clarifying that. I'm actually not familiar with the CBE scheme, so I can't answer in detail. But in, in general, yes, of course, this is imaginable. Um, in, in many cases, actually, test reports are already issued internationally. Um, a product that is sold in Europe may be tested in China, for example, by a Chinese test lab using a European test procedure or the relevant international test procedure. So in itself, things are already moving in this direction. Whether one test could cover all deviations to the test procedure for various economies um, will depend largely on how comparable the test procedures are, I think. Because in many cases, it's not so easy to add a national deviation to test procedures as they currently exist, uh, with, with, with few exceptions. So imaginable, yes. Around the corner, probably not yet. Um, and it's a topic to look at a bit more in detail, I guess, at a later moment. Thank you. We'll move on to the next question. Um, in, in that, since many appliances cater to different geoclimatic conditions, is it practical to expect them to be comparable? And would it be better to compare uh, standards in different climatic conditions? And we did already address this, so if you'd like to uh, move on to the next one, um, just let me know. Um, I'll answer it really briefly. Um, different climatic conditions do matter. Uh, mainly for those products that actually deal with heating and cooling and for many other products that are actually not so relevant. So there, there are many products that, for which climatic conditions have hardly any impact. Uh, and, and so the question really applies to a subset. For that subset, yes, it does matter. In some cases, you do want to align with national conditions more than international test procedures. Uh, space and water heating was one example that we talked about in air conditioning, the other one, I think. Thank you for addressing that, Frank. Uh, and the next question asks, a country may not be interested in developing global solutions. What organizations are best positioned to develop and support global tests, metrics, and levels? That probably is the $1 million question. Um, in, in, in some ways, it's easy to answer. If countries are not interested in developing global solutions, is there a need for them? Um, in, in the end, this international work is being done to support countries. There are global organizations that can do this kind of work. IEC and ISO come to mind, for example, as organizations that, that are set up specifically to develop international test procedures and sometimes efficiency metrics. And, of course, there's a SEED initiative that, that we can say a lot more about than I can. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, I think, you know, obviously the IEC and ISO are, are the international bodies that everyone looks, that I think a lot of countries look to uh, when they're setting their own national uh, test procedures in particular. And in some cases, as I think Frank mentioned for motors, um, the IEC method also has the, uh, the actual uh, levels, the IE2, IE3, IE4 levels. Um, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, collaboration between uh, SEED, the SEED initiative, IEA 4E and IEA, um, together working with the IEC and ISO to try and figure out these kinds of questions as to how we can do this better on, the inter on an international scale, um, especially given, you know, all, all countries have resources stretched thin on this, and so to the extent that we can come up with these international or global solutions um, to make the lives easier for national um, policymakers. That's always um, useful. So that is something that we are working on. And um, again, if this is a particular area of interest for you, please feel free to contact me. Um, this is Debbie, <laughs> and uh, and we'll be happy to to fill you in more on on what we're doing there. Great. Thank you, Debbie and Frank. Um, and the next question from our audience, 
asks, uh, how soon do you see the standards for various appliances getting revised, and how should these aspects be figured from, starting, from the starting of the program or policy? Um, I think it really depends on on the country. So are we talking about test standards or are we for various appliances? I guess we're talking about appliance standards. Well, the U.S. has a schedule that um, is pretty reasonably clear. Um, other countries, the EU in particular, seems to update much faster than 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 the U.S. If you look at Energy Star, Energy Star also is 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 faster than than the U.S. federal test standards. Um, and in terms of international test procedures, they they are some of them are, are like the the new motors test standard is being developed currently for certain for certain products because because there was a need for a different a different type of test procedure and and other other test standards are developed on on their own schedule, schedules so it, it it varies considerably and it varies with need and political will and I guess the will of industry also and stakeholders. So, uh, not not an easy question to answer, but um, hopefully that was of some help. Great, thank you, Mia. Um, and we are running low on time here, so I'd like to move on to our last question. Um, and that question asks if there has been any study conducted. Uh, testing the products again after one year of usage to gauge the variations in the nameplate rated values. Um, I believe there have been some experimental studies, not that many. Um, in, in general, regulated energy performance of a product is defined as at the moment of sale and not after products have been in use for a while. And, and from that perspective, the tests, these tests are not done so often. I believe there have been some experimental studies by the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I actually don't know what the results of that are. Um, in, in many cases, I wouldn't expect much variation in, in terms of performance. The only product for which I know that testing after some time of usage is included are some lighting products where a, an aging factor is built into the test procedure. Um, but in, in general, I'm, I'm, I don't think we have seen many studies looking at performance of the product after a year of usage. Now, it wouldn't be an easy study to do because product performance as it is defined in a test procedure is usually tested in a, in a test lab under specific conditions, quite defined conditions, whereas in use usually means in use in a household or a company where the test conditions are quite different. So results may also not be that comparable. It would be quite, it, it might be a complicated if, if interesting study to, to look at usage after some time of usage, whether that's one year or five years, I'm not even sure. This is also, this is Debbie, this is also a line of research at class that we've been interested in and looking to a little bit. Um, we have found that there's a study being conducted by the Brazilian uh, government, uh, Electrograph, in Brazil, um, and they're looking at the um, the energy efficiency degradation of refrigerators, um, and it does exist, so I don't remember uh, off the top of my head what the percentages are. Um, and I think we may have one or two other studies that we um, have in mind, but I can't recall what they are. Um, so again, I'd ask for whoever submitted that question if you can um, get in touch with me. Uh, that would be great, and we can share what resources we do have. Um, there's also been, you know, for lighting, in particular LED lighting, there's been a lot of testing about the degradation of, of LEDs, which tend to hold up pretty well. Um, but I'm happy to share more information. I just don't have it on hand. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and Mia, I believe you wanted to address one more question. If you want to go ahead and, and just read that question and provide a very um, brief response to it um, as we are running out of time. 
uh, I think Frank wanted to address a, que a question. I, I just saw one question pop up, which I think might be interesting for other participants also. And the question is, in cases when a country does not have much in terms of gas and milk policies, how should technologies be prioritized for possible introduction of energy performance standards, especially if they do not have local production capacity for most of such technologies? Um, equipment and appliances are mostly imported. And the, the, the question is specifically about Central Asia also. Although the answer probably is it's more generically. Um, it, it, it probably helps to start looking at, the, at, at products for which standards and labels and test procedures are, are already well defined. It, it means that international manufacturers, which are also the ones exporting to countries without SNL, SNL programs in place, are familiar with the test procedures, the efficiency metrics and standard levels and can probably manufacture efficient products at a reasonable cost because they have built experience in other economies. So, so that is probably one factor to look at. Another one, and certainly not trivial, is the energy demand of various products. It probably makes sense to look at which products consume most energy and which products show the, the largest efficiency improvement potential for the lowest cost. And there are some tools, uh, and, and PASP has offered many of those tools over the years, that, that really help in assessing this. And I would certainly encourage you to, to look at PASP websites, look at the various tools available, and, and make use of those to determine which products are the, the easiest and the most beneficial to start with in any given economy. And thank you for the question. Thank you, Frank. Um, and we will move on quickly. Um, again, thank you to the panelists for the, the question and answer session and the discussion and the attendees for those. Uh, we do have a very quick survey for our audience. It's just three uh, quick multiple choice questions. Uh, Heather, if you want to go ahead and display that first question. And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. And in the next question, please. The webinar's presenters were effective. And then our final question is, overall, the webinar met high expectations. Great. Thank you very much for answering our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I would just like to again thank our, our panelists for joining us today and for our attendees for participating in the webinar. Uh, we very much appreciate everyone's time. And uh, I do invite our attendees to check the Solutions Center website if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentations, as well as any previously held webinars. Additionally, on there you can find information on the upcoming webinars and other training events. And we are now also posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Uh, please allow a couple days for the audio recording to be posted to the Solutions Center website and for a couple weeks for it to be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy support. With that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar. Great. Um, I just want to, say, if I, if there's still airtime, I just want to say thank you to all of the attendees and for the great questions, because we spent obviously a long time uh, on this report, and it's only interesting in as much as it's interesting to you guys, and you've asked great questions, so that's really great for us. Thank you. Great. Thanks again.